I have to do is silence my cell phone. <laughs> okay, so far so good. It's really nice to be with you all tonight. I'd like to thank uh, Irina for the introduction and uh, her and Jeff for being such uh, gracious hosts here. I've really enjoyed my, my day uh, here very much and I'm glad to be with you all this evening. When I first um, uh, signed up for this talk and, and provided a, a topic, it was um, the power of myth and the challenge of climate change. And I am going to talk about that, but it's, that, was, that was several months ago and it's kept evolving for me. I kept, obviously this is a, this is a vast topic and uh, it calls uh, for all sorts of expertise I don't have. So I kept trying to find a way to, to frame it and to, and, to, and to pull it into focus. And eventually, and just about a week ago, I thought, these, these outlines are getting so complicated, I'd like to write a narrative about my encounter with ancient stories and what they've meant to me over the past six months. Because this is a, this is a story, as you're about to see, that begins in Sicily in September and it goes through the Women's March in the day after the inauguration. Um, so what I'll, what I'll do is read to you a, a portion from this uh, very fresh essay, uh, and then I, I look forward to sharing those thoughts with you, but, but knowing that the, uh, the chance to have uh, exchange with you at the end will be particularly valuable because, because there's a lot of work that these, uh, these ideas uh, require. So my new, my new title, although it really is about the power of myth and the challenge of climate change, is Persephone and the Women's March. In September of 2016, my wife Rita and I traveled in Sicily, where I was to teach for a branch of the Breadloaf Writers' Conference. From the balcony of our hotel room in the ancient mountain town of Erice, where this workshop took place, 
we could gaze straight down past a fringe of palms and banana trees to the crescent beach and salt flats of Tropany. The trees tossing fronds and the white flecked sea through which red and blue fishing boats forged showed us that stiff winds often prevailed at that beach, hundreds of meters below our perch. Turning our eyes to the east, we saw dry brown hills through which a narrow road wound. At one point during the workshop, we joined a group taking a tour bus along that road to visit the Greek ruins at Segesta. After it carried us over the first uh, rank of hills, we suddenly saw ridge after ridge of white wind turbines climbing ahead of us into the island's stony interior. They were snow white, like the mobiles we know from the Lowell Wind Project in Craftsbury. Even on a blustery day, the three long veins revolving on them moved with an uncanny slowness. We've often been to Italy, since Rita has quite a few relatives there in a lovely hill town east of Rome called Artana. But the stark drama of Sicily was a revelation to both of us. A jumble of architectural, linguistic, and cultural influences register the island's 5,000-year history of combat and conquest. The Greeks did battle with the Phoenicians here, the Romans with the Carthaginians. A couple of decades before Normans fought their way across England, their cousins had conquered Sicily. It was considered much the richer prize, given the splendor of Palermo, the wheat, grapes, and meat produced in the hot interior, and the profitable trade routes intersecting at this crossroads of the Mediterranean. Meanwhile, Sicily's southwestern coast, lying just a few miles from northern Africa, was also repeatedly occupied by Arab traders who built mosques on top and from the material of Norman churches. Whenever the Normans surged back to reclaim such territory, they returned the favor, architecturally speaking. <laughs> In Mazara del Vallo, we visited a Norman church of rustic gray stone with a broad dome of Moorish green lingering grandly beside, behind its Christian spire. It was a tasty melange, an equivalent in its way to one of southwestern Sicily's signature dishes, couscous di pesce, fish couscous. Such, such juxtapositions lent an antic seething quality to the built landscape in Sicily. It was reminiscent of the Dutch artist M. C. Escher's woodblocks, in which sharply contrasting shapes of angels and devils, birds and fish, emer emerge ceaselessly from each other's ranks. Viewing such vertiginous designs, one has the sense of simultaneously falling into a well and floating off into the sky. The island's <coughs> arid center has a similarly dreamlike quality, with its rugged, uh, almost vertical cliffs of basalt and tuff, and the fiery spectacle of Mount Etna, Europe's most dramatically active volcano. Freud described the imagery of dreams as uncanny, for which his German word was unheimlich, or unhomely, because the faces and landscapes in dreams can feel at once familiar and strange. They offer arresting glimpses of the usually unseen tectonic forces that can crumple and invert the, plac the placid social service surfaces of our lives. We too felt at once mystified and fascinated while traveling across this realm of relics and collisions after the conclusion of the initial week-long conference. Giants waved their slow arms at us from distant hills, and lava welled up among boulders that had not so long before been molten themselves. Sicily was part of Magna Graeca, or Greater Greece, for hundreds of years. One result is that today, many of the best preserved Greek temples in the world stand on this island. The Valley of the Temples, lying downslope from the city of Agrigento, offer an especially impressive collection of such sacred sites. But even more arresting than all those Doric columns were the myths rooted in the Sicilian landscape. Not myths that the Greek settlers brought here, but rather images and stories that had already long inhabited Sicily before they were incorporated into the suave, sophisticated Olympian pantheon. These stories were much more raw. Like ruins, 
Such myths share the uncanny, revelatory quality of dreams. The Homeric gods and goddesses manifest recognizably human feelings of lust and love. They harbor grudges, they fight, and from time to time they even show compassion, just as the Achaeans and the Trojans do. But they also have ichor in their veins instead of blood and live forever. That makes a difference. As does Zeus's control of the thunder and lightning, Poseidon's mastery of the sea, and Athena's ability to direct the course of battle by disguising herself as a mortal warrior. Looking through the windshield of our rented fiat or consulting the road map at the beginning of each day, we were frequently reminded of Sicily's native myths. The 400 tall, foot tall wind turbines reminded me of Polyphemus and his one-eyed brethren, powerful giants, though finally not quick or clever enough to stop wily Odysseus from escaping. Similarly, the many-headed hydra Scylla and the whirlpool Charybdis, between which Odysseus had to navigate his ship in Homer's account, were situated by the Greeks specifically in the Strait of Messina, the rough seas separating Sicily from the toe of the Italian boot. But the Sicilian myth that struck me most during our travels in September and October, and that also speaks most powerfully to the cultural transformation required of us now by climate change, was the story of Persephone. This is Proserpina in the, in the Roman version of her name. The most ancient versions of this myth specified that Persephone was abducted by Hades, king of the underworld, at Lake Pergusa, beside the mountain town of Enna that lies almost exactly at the island's center. She was stolen away while gathering flowers and momentarily out of sight by her mother Demeter, goddess of the blossoming world and of agriculture. I should pause to say, how's my volume back there? Is it okay? Give me this subtle signal if, it, if I should ever dip. As I already knew from my tattered collection of Greek myths for children, as well as from the account in Ovid's Metamorphoses, Demeter's grief for the loss of her daughter was so great that all vegetation on the earth died away after her daughter's disappearance. For this reason, Zeus had to, def to descend. Did I say that, she, that Demeter was the goddess of the flowering world and agriculture? I was, uh, then I got distracted by my watch band. For this reason, Zeus had to descend to the lair of his brother, Hades, and force him to release Persephone. But since she had clandestinely eaten a few seeds of pomegranate while in captivity, she was still required to return to the underworld for part of every year. That's why, following the harvest, the earth always grows cold again, leaves fall, and fields become dormant. I learned that the Sicilian version of Persephone, the much older, much, much older version, uh, perhaps a thousand years older, was in fact a more mysterious and powerful figure than the one who was originally, in, who was eventually enrolled in the Olympian hierarchy. For instance, in the original telling, Persephone was not punished for her undisciplined eating while in captivity. She chose to eat those seeds in order to preside as the queen of the underworld. From such a perspective, Persephone begins to emerge as a deity offering a symbolically richer understanding of climate change. A certain discomfort on the part of the Greeks with both Persephone and Demeter seems to be registered in Homer's terrifying picture of Persephone as sternly meeting, sorting, and directing the heroic dead as they arrive in Hades, with Hades himself nowhere in view. In Agrigento's Valley of the Temples, too, mother and daughter were worshipped together at their own temple that had screened its celebrations from the uninitiated by a high internal wall and was dedicated to the, and this is one of my favorite new words, chthonic, C-T-H-O-N-I-C, chthonic or earth gods. All these proliferating versions of Persephone and Demeter's story recalled for me Leslie Marmon Silko's wonderful essay, Landscape History and the Pueblo Imagination, in which she writes, the ancient people perceived the world and themselves within that world as part of an ancient continuous story composed of, innumerous bund of innumerable bundles of other stories. They sought a communal truth, not an absolute. For them, 
This truth lived somewhere within the web of differing versions. I've found that such bundles of stories gain power from their sense of conveying elemental collective truths that transcend human individuality. And Persephone and Demeter resonate with this sense of something that, uh, that transcends the individual. It, it, it's, uh, you, you can feel that in their other names. They each have another name. Uh, the, the other name for Persephone is Kore, which means the maiden. Whereas Demeter, within her name, uh, if, you, if you look at the Indo-European root, M-E-T-E-R, means mother. So they're the maiden and the mother. Just as today we've begun talking about the crone and the different stages of a woman's life, they're all one figure, uh, linking them in, a, sim in a, uh, a single temple dedicated to the Chthonic gods, suggested that they were actually viewed as, symbol as, as different faces or phases of female divinity, avatars of the goddess, sometimes called Gaia or Earth, whom human beings worshipped for 40,000 years. In other words, we worship the goddess for perhaps eight times longer uh, than we've worshipped the sky gods who followed up on them. All around the Mediterranean, the Middle East, uh, people began to turn towards sky gods, hierarchical figures of power and identified as specifically male. There's a theory for why this religious shift occurred in countries like Israel, Persia, and uh, Greece. Namely, that it happened shortly after the um, emergence of agriculture from the, from the hunter-gatherer uh, origins, and with agriculture, the capacity to store large amounts of food in granaries, and then the cities that grew up around these stocks of food, people didn't need to move so much because the food was in one place, and from the cities followed the kings and the soldiers who uh, offered to protect, uh, to protect uh, all those, uh, those stores. Uh, and, uh, and with that came a new hierarchical vision of society much more than any sense of hierarchy that apparently prevailed or would have prevailed when small, they, they often estimate 20 to 30 people, bands, multi-generational bands of hunter-gatherers had followed the reindeer across southern Europe in the interglacial periods where forests were beginning to come back. <coughs> Demeter's story in one telling, in one version of its telling, uh, was that she eventually got married to Dionysus. Uh, a, a very hot god, an orgiastic, <laughs> orgiastic god, the god of the harvest and of, and of wine. And given the sense that, that Persephone and, and Demeter are, are two sides of one circuit, that mirrors and completes uh, Persephone's descent into, he in, into Hades with the coldest of the gods in the same way that winter and summer complement each other and complete each other within the circle of the seasons. The wholeness of the year that includes both barrenness and plenty was worshipped by the devotees of the chthonic, or another wonderful word coming up now, Eleusinian mysteries. The, we don't know exactly how these mysteries were celebrated because only the initiate could see them, but there are some various texts about them, including one Homeric hymn, that say they began, the, the, the mysteries, with a reenactment of, of Persephone's descent into the underworld and they ended in a moment of mystic <coughs> contemplation as an ear of wheat, the promise of immortality, was held aloft before the celebrants. This sense of, of uh, not just celebrating the harvest, but celebrating the cold time and the dark time uh, speaks to what I found the special relevance of Persephone and her mother to the ecological and cultural crisis of our time, which is climate change. And this became, in, in the story of my grappling with this idea, this became clear to me only at the end of our time in Sicily. For the first several weeks, I've been reading about Sicily. We've been going to temples. We've been, we've been looking at ancient statues and thinking about our connection with other uh, avatars of the goddess, an idea I'll come back to. But toward the end of our time, in fact, the last place we stopped before we, we caught a plane to come back to Vermont, we were sitting under a large striped umbrella in the cobblestone qu uh, square of Cefalu, which is on the, the northern uh, coast of, si of Sicily. We were enjoying an afternoon coffee while gazing up at the rugged towers of the cathedral we just visited there. It was begun in 1311, in, excuse me, in 1131, by Roger II, Roger II, the most famous of the Norman kings. 
And uh, the grandeur of it is, is really remarkable. It's, it's not only is it very large, but the interior is very high. Uh, it's also uh, made more grand and mysterious by the fact that they decided to cannibalize the Doric columns from the local Greek ruins and put them inside as the columns that, that mark the aisles of the, of the cathedral. And it's, all, it's always, even on a brilliant day in October, we found very dark and shadowy, cool inside, Persephone-like. But by far the most impressive feature of this cathedral is the astonishing golden mosaic of Christo Pantocrator, the triumphant Christ, that fills the apse's inner dome. It wasn't completed till 1170. Uh, King, King Roger II had brought in a crack team of uh, Byzantine masters of mosaic to work on it. And when it was finished, uh, many people consider it the most powerful manifestation of Byzantine mosaic in the Western world. The reason he put so much into it was that he wanted to establish his dynasty's uh, primacy in the religious as well as the political life of Sicily. He wanted to supersede all those churches that had been built under the sponsorship of the Vatican around, around uh, Palermo. When Rita and I had walked down the cathedral's long aisle earlier in that day, hoping to get a fuller view of the mosaic, we still couldn't exactly make out all its details in that dusky space so far above our heads. Then a guide for a nearby group of German tourists who had expectantly set up their cameras on tripods dropped a couple of euros in a slot. Upward pointing lamps flared into the apse and the mosaic blazed back at us. We felt as if we were falling into the sun. It was not just the voltage of all those reflective gold tiles <coughs> surging across the stone sky. Each of the mosaic's figures and every ornamental motif was rendered more vibrant by the contrast of their blues, greens, and reds to this vivid background. Arrayed around the central, solemn face of Christ himself were Mary with her retinue of gorgeous archangels, a procession of apostles, saints, and prophets, and delegations of seraphim and cherubim. The overall impression was of glorious, inclusive symmetry, anticipating by a century and a half Dante's concentric vision of heaven near the end of Paradiso. The impact of Christ's huge countenance at the center of the design in Cefalu conveyed his divine power above all. <clears throat> Rita and I had walked over to visit the cathedral from a Franciscan monastery where we were staying in town. We'd been told about the possibility of renting a room there by our Vermont friend Grace, who frequently went to Cefalu to participate in anti-mafia projects, which the local Franciscans also supported. Built in 1211, this monastic complex in the heart of the town's historic district felt echoingly empty when we first checked in there on the day before going to see the cathedral. There were, frequent, there were apparently only five monks still in residence. And during our visit, we had contact with just one of them, Padre Aurelio, Aurelio. Several women in their 50s staffed the office where we registered, and a jolly caretaker named Giuseppe came over to greet us whenever we walked through the cloister's pillared, pillared walkway. He spoke no Italian, and we couldn't understand a word of his Sicilian. But his goodwill, plus his curiosity about us, made the encounters fun for him and us alike. Our other regular encounters at the monastery were with crews of skinny neighborhood cats drawn to the plates of scraps left out for them, both in the walk and in the overgrown garden of banana and orange trees running, running alongside it. Our room was on a long corridor of what would have earlier been monastic cells. Though bare and undecorated, it had, it, it had been modernized at some point in the mid-20th century and now contained two small beds, a desk, and a chair, and its own bathroom, complete with shower. At first, we thought we might have been the only ones on the hall. When night fell, though, we were surprised to find the other rooms also occupied. We realized then that in addition to their anti-mafia efforts, the few remaining Franciscans had decided to turn their largely empty monastery into an emergency shelter for the hopeless of Chefalu and the surrounding region. The rooms on our own corridor seemed to be primarily for women and families. Right across the hall from us, a mother and her teenage son were staying. They were nicely dressed and well-spoken and had apparently just arrived from work and school, respectively. On the floor above us seemed to be only men. 
Those we met downstairs the next day were red-faced and appeared ill. Though they were slumped on the uh, stone, worn stone benches of the cloister and seemed to be grappling with alcoholism and other demons, they had at least found their way into this quiet, safe harbor. In a refectory that would once have been filled with brown-robed monks, Chefalu's homeless could now get a hot meal and a cup of coffee before venturing back into the wilderness of traffic and commerce where they'd lost their way. If the cathedral was on one level an expression of political power, the monastery replaced such striving for status with compassion for the sufferings of the homeless. At the heart of this monastic compound was that unkempt but flourishing garden where stray cats could take a peaceful noontime nap in the shade of the banana tree's drooping leaves. Instead of the cathedral's throngs of tourists like us, snapping pictures with expensive cameras and phones and avidly purchasing booklets and postcards from the gift shop, here there was an old, largely empty structure filled each night by a rising tide of homelessness and neediness. Against the golden background of the cathedral, the modest features of the monastery shone out with sinuous cats gleaming from the garden, like wary cherubim. Because we had arrived at this monastery at the beginning of October, we were there for a feast called the Transit of St. Francis. This commemoration of the saint's death and transfiguration was one of which even Rita, a practicing Catholic of proud Italian heritage, had not previously heard. It involved early morning services of chanting and prayer, which she and I attended in a small room to one side of the monastery's chapel. The missal from which our responsive readings came was largely drawn from the prayers of St. Francis himself, including Laudato Si, the prayer with which Pope Francis last year framed his encyclical relating climate change to the urgent importance of loving both nature and the poor. It was a revelation to join in reading aloud from these prayers with their illustrations of the remarkable inclusiveness of St. Francis's love for the natural creation. Not only did he declare his gratitude to Brother Sun and Sister Moon, he seemed to give thanks for every detail of the world around him, right down to praising the existence of both heat and cold, dryness and wetness. In spirit, these prayers recalled the great thanksgiving of native peoples of the northeast of the United States, in which ample time is taken to thank all forms of life rather than rushing to a more generalized expression of gratitude. The upshot of such praise for the little but essential lives surrounding our human communities comes in the resultant feeling, as Potawatomi writer and scientist Robin Wall Kemmerer puts it in her chapter, Allegiance to Gratitude, from her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, that now our minds are one. While there were only four or five of us visitors with Padre Aurelio in the chapel for the morning readings and chanting, on October 2nd, the monastery's main sanctuary was filled for a celebration of the transit. There were many families with small children who were carried up before and after the two and a half hour service to a side section where several of the aged monks sat so that they could be kissed and blessed. Knowing that there was a growing order of lay Franciscans around the world, we wondered if many of the people in that congregation might have been members of this movement. During the whole lengthy service though, with its lengthy uh, sermons, uh, all its readings, its songs led by a small lay choir accompanied by a portable electric keyboard, my eyes were constantly drawn to two riveting statues. The monastery's chapel, while beautifully proportioned, contained little memorable art. Dark, muddy paintings hung on the walls uh, beside the pews. The nave itself was largely unadorned, though tall, narrow windows set high in the thick stone walls, did allow shafts of light to move beautifully across that simple space throughout the day. But the statues to either side of the, of the chapel's altar impressed me even more than the cathedral's golden Cristo Pantocrator and have continued to dominate my memories of Sicily. One was a marble representation of the virgin and child standing about three feet high on its pedestal and situated to the right of the altar steps as viewed from the pews. It seemed once to have been painted in strong primary colors, and though that paint had largely faded away, the sculpture still appeared tinted as with a light wash. Mary was quite slender, with a strikingly young face gazing out serenely from the cowl 
covering her head and hair as she cradled the holy child in her left arm. Though her ample sleeves enveloped her arms to the wrists, and her gown reached to the floor, concealing her feet, her draping garments had nevertheless been divided in front to expose her small right breast. Jesus was no chubby baby in this, in this depiction, but rather a well-grown child of one and a half or two, stretching his arms avidly toward the breast, one hand curved down toward the breast from above, while the other reached up from below in a reflection of hunger that might have been alarming were the expression on his mother's face not so imperturbable. Balancing this focus on Jesus and the breast was the pomegranate that Mary held out to her right side. This fruit resting on her palm was instantly recognizable by its tall, gently fluted shape, with a little crown of five points on the top indicating where the flower petals fell away when the ovary ripened. A pink tinge remained from the red paint originally applied to this sculptural detail. The statue's freshness and humor, along with the striking juxtaposition of the child's urgency and his mother's composure, drew me over to it each time we entered the chapel during our stay at the monastery. But what I wondered was the meaning of the pomegranate displayed in Mary's hand as if it summed up the work of art's meaning. Padre Aurelio, to whom I posed this question, simply said, it was a symbol for the church. But Rita, steeped in the artistic heritage of her Roman family and her faith, told me that this particular symbol was one she'd never encountered before. As I think back now to this Cefalu statue of mother and child, that emblem of, of the pomegranate becomes increasingly central if still mysterious. The other unforgettable sculpture in that monastery was a modern, nearly life-size, wooden carving standing beside the pulpit at the left of the altar. Like the ancient image of Mary and Jesus, this contemporary statue was polychromed in the medieval manner. Against the unpainted wood of the saint's hands and face, the brown monastic robe and the snow-white plumage of the doves perching on his outstretched hands made striking contrast. Two small doves, their tail feathers fanned out as if they'd just alit, sat calmly on his left palm. While a single dove was gently cupped in his right hand, St. Francis bent his whole torso over to gaze at the bird, drinking in the sight of it with a rapturous expression. The sheer joy with which he lost himself in regarding this creature, he would have called Sister Dove, reminded me of a phrase sometimes uh, used to describe the extraordinary openness to the world experienced by artists, scientists, and other lovers of nature, the naturalist's gaze. For Francis, too, the life of that small bird in his right hand was a miracle of connection and identification, erasing for a moment the walls separating creatures and minds from one another. And I'll just uh, interject here. I'm, I'm cutting some pieces out, but I want to give you the, the whole flow of this, as I say, brand new, as of this morning, uh, a narrative. Um, the reason that St. Francis is so important to me is finally I look at the goddess as uh, a liberating force for men and women alike and figures like St. Francis as contributing to uh, a kind of uh, uh, amplification of certain um, qualities that have stereotypically been called feminine. That, that's where the argument's going and that's how St. Francis gets in here. The contrast between the power of the cathedral and the tenderness of the monastery brought to mind a late chapter in Alfred North Whitehead's Process and Reality, called God in the World. After Whitehead has, has discussed monolithic conceptions of God, <clears throat> modeled on the power of emperors, the moral absolutes of the Hebrew prophets, and the, lore, the logical hierarchies of Greek philosophy, the poetry-loving physicist Whitehead writes, there is, however, in the Galilean origin of Christianity, yet another suggestion that does not fit very well with any of the three main strands of of thought. It does not emphasize the ruling Caesar or the ruthless moralist or the unmoved mover. It dwells upon the tender elements of the world which slowly and in quietness operate by love. And it finds purpose in the present immediacy of a king, a kingdom, not of this world. Love neither rules nor is it unmoved. Also it is a little oblivious as to morals. It does not look to the future for it finds its own reward in the immediate present. Whitehead finds in the seed time and harvest of the natural world an antidote to identifications of God above all with power. 
Such an emphasis echoes the way in which the early versions of Persephone and Demeter, maiden and mother, complemented the Olympian pantheon through their manifestations of a primal female principle of fertility and health. At the deepest level, I believe that the women's movement in our own day has a similar potential for correcting the unwholesome emphasis on power and hierarchy uh, within our social structures. It may lead the way to cultural transformation that will allow us to engage more significantly than we yet have done with the challenge of climate change. The dramatic contrast between those two sacred spaces in Chefalu recalled for me a passage in a book that already fascinated me. It was uh, Forests, the Shadow of Civilization by the comparative literature scholar Robert Pogue Harrison. And in it, in one little, one little passage, he discusses the surprising reappearances of the goddess, like Persephone, as I've argued, throughout human history. Here's what, here's what Harrison says. In Artemis's city of Ephesus, Artemis was another goddess avatar, as he argues, a, a, a kind of primal female deity. In Artemis's city of Ephesus, the Christian prelates convened in AD 431 to discuss the alarming cults of the Virgin Mary which had spread throughout the Christian community. The church at that time was decisively hostile toward Mary, her worship being dangerously reminiscent of paganism. But it was decided by the bishops in Ephesus that her following was too popular and that the church would do best to canonize her. Mary was officially declared the mother of God and Artemis's traditional festival day, August 15th, was chosen as the holy day of Mary's assumption into heaven. Thus was the virgin goddess assimilated yet again into a new religious order. This was only the most recent chapter in the story of her various accommodations to new religious institutions. Prior to the Christian revolution, the Olympian pantheon had to make uh, room for Artemis, for she was originally an outsider among the Olympians, so much that Hesiod had to invent a genealogy for her. I, I love this sense that, that, that Mary sort of emerges up into the Godhead because the people require it. Uh, and and the, the same thing happened with Artemis in Greek, uh, Greek uh, mythology. And it, it confirms something that, that Jung has said, namely that um, there are certain symbols that become, and this is Jung's word, statements of the soul, which, again, Jung's language, precipitate the complexes of ideas in the form of uh, mythological motifs and have the illuminating power of dreams. What, what excites me about this is, as you can see, I'm working with the sense that, that Persephone has something we need at this moment of crisis, but that doesn't mean we can go out and come up with a, a program based upon her or that we could reintroduce, even if we wanted, goddess worship in the ancient form. What it does mean is that there are certain bundles of, of ideals and values and emotions that, that are perpetually re-arising. We need to recognize the possibility for reorienting our culture uh, to these ideas in the forms they come to us now. Our Sicilian encounters with Persephone left me inclined to believe that the recurrence of the goddess in these different forms is more than just a theme in intellectual history. It's a current, deep in Western culture, which has retained the potential to promote transformation at this moment of crisis. I'm struck. Uh, as, as global warming uh, is such an arresting uh, challenge for us, by the vast inherited potential of the women's movement as an agent for this requisite cultural transformation and for the continuity at a symbolic level uh, with, uh, with uh, worship for the, the uh, Earth Mother that goes back into the beginning of our human history. On the day after an inauguration so crudely expressive of sky god values, including self-assertive power, exclusiveness, and a lack of charity. I was one of many people feeling buoyed up by the women's marches taking place around the country and the world. By and large, these events seem to emphasize ambitious, positive values rather than lingering on the new administration's obvious faults. Their ultimate power was at a deep symbolic and emotional layer, a le level uh, that much more powerfully pushed back than uh, simple arguments would have done against the tactics of our new president. An article in the New York Times had profiled the Brexiteer Aaron Banks, who had advised both Nigel Farage in the UK and Donald Trump. Never apologize, he said he had told Mr. Trump, 
facts are white noise and emotions rule. The conduct and grandeur of the women's marches, unlike the daily tweets and petulance uh, that, Gal that, that so fascinated the mainstream media, conveyed a corresponding sense that, that uh, all of that noise, uh, all of that controversy was so much white noise too. There was a much bigger and deeper contest underway between power structures inhibiting our identification with each other in the natural world and a more inclusive and poetic vision of life together on Earth. Because Rita has some problems with mobility, she decided she'd better not try to participate in one of the women's marches. So we both ended up staying home together and following eagerly the dispatches sent home from our friends in Washington as well as uh, from Montpelier with its 15 to 20,000 uh, marchers, uh, including our son Caleb and our daughter-in-law, Michaela. Later in the day, we were also particularly excited to read about the march in Los Angeles for which 750,000 people turned out, one of whom was our daughter, Rachel. It wasn't just the millions of participants who eventually took part in all the marches uh, here and overseas that thrilled us. It was also the feeling of high-spirited energy tapping into a deep and ancient reservoir of hope just when it was most needed. The fact that it was a women's march was symbolically essential, given the present contest, contest between a hierarchical competitive vision and a deep inclusive one. It reflected the availability to, huma to humanity at this very moment of an enduring power and the possibility for a deep reimagination of humanity's place in the vast cycles of nature, available to all of us. In the archaeological and artistic evidence remaining from all those thousands of years when small multi-generational bands of hunter-gatherers moved across uh, Europe, there were no indications of competing male and female deities. To the contrary, the all-embracing love of Mother Earth speaks eloquently from the cave paintings at Lascaux and Peshmerel. Early on, some uh, critics suggested that these might have been produced as magical hunting aids, but that argument fell away when it was observed how few food animals and scenes of hunting figured on the walls, and how rudimentary and rare were the images of human beings in those grand tableaux. The emphasis was on the elegance of horses and auroxes, the grandeur of mammoths. The feelings expressed by these deft and tender paintings rippling across those stone walls beneath the surface of the earth was and is beautiful, so beautiful. Participants in the women's marches explicitly drew attention to specific issues of importance to women that were in conflict with statements and actions of the new president. But in the pink knit hats sported by many marchers, these events also felt like celebrations. Parties like Mardi Gras that marked a turning of the year, preparing for a new season, and also for a heightened degree of focus on the community's fundamental values. One of my favorite photos from the Montpelier March was one Michaela sent us of our large son, Caleb, sporting both his bushy red beard and a pink knit, knit hat with ears that matched the hat on Michaela's head. Draped over the shoulders of his red and black Johnson wool jacket was a long, delightfully garish garland of plastic roses as he grinned at the camera, arms crossed in a Whitmanesque slouch. Feminist scholars have long since dismantled the presumption that bundles of attributes stere stereotypically described as masculine or feminine have primarily to do with X and Y chromosomes. Genders, as writers like Judith Butler have argued, are to an intriguing degree categories which men and women are socialized to perform. From such a perspective, the women's movement, with its claim for freedom from restricting female roles, is also a movement for human liberation more broadly. It's a movement with strong affinities with the legacy of Galilean tenderness and the passionate love for nature and the poor shown by St. Francis. It's also both a forerunner and a corollary of the Romantic movement, dating from um, uh, excuse me, the, it, both a corollary and a forerunner of the women's movement was the Romantic movement, dating from the late 18th century in Western Europe and the United States. That arose as a direct response to values associated with the Enlightenment, or to put it another way, uh, with um, uh, values related to elite um, um, wealthy males in the capitals of Europe. In response to the formal, controlling, rational, and elite values of the time, thinkers and artists like the Brothers Grimm in Germany and Wordsworth in England 
countered with an organic, natural, and emotional aesthetic. You, you can see it's all, it's all part of one, one reaction. And also with a keen appreciation for the insights con conveyed by dreams and by old wives' tales. So these artists, opposed to the metropolitan and uh, privileged values, uh, the wisdom of rural traditions and the beauty of the poor. I think that romanticism, with which the environmental movement, the women's movement, the anti-colonial movement, and the civil rights movement all claim an affinity, may in fact be seen as an effort that continues until today, an effort of two and a half centuries, fundamentally dedicated to refeminizing culture. It's in effect a project for survival, a vehicle not only for escape from destructive practices that threaten our behavior, but also from the politics of domination the economics of endless hyperthyroid growth, and the culture of isolated individuality. There are so many behaviors and policies we need to change immediately if we're to mitigate the impact of carbon deposition in the atmosphere to any significant degree. <coughs> the fact that we've not yet done so, despite all we know about the gravity of global warming, reflects the underlying fact that such a change in our collective actions ultimately requires a fundamental cultural transformation. The melting of glaciers of the, and of the entire Greenland ice cap, the flooding of inhabited islands uh, and of impoverished coastal communities, the desertification of continental interiors are all inseparable from the individualism, competitiveness, consumerism, and everyday reliance on fossil fuels in affluent societies of the West and the Pacific Rim. And it did not escape me during our trip to Sicily that the jet fuel burned on our flights from Burlington to Palermo and the, and the uh, gasoline used in our Sicilian rental car after the workshop was over were important parts of this knotty riddle. They were all tied up in the knot. Where can one stand in order to reshape one's life or to rethink the society of which it's a part? Is there a way to be simultaneously within and without ourselves in order to affect such a change? Partly. Uh, connecting with an ancient myth like that of Persephone is a way of finding within our place and within our society resources. We don't have to seek always beyond our Western heritage. I think this question of how can we stand both in, in and out, it's, it frames another paradox worthy of M.C. Escher, whom I mentioned before, or per perhaps more to the point of another figure often in, invoked in college uh, courses on English and environmental studies, Henry David Thoreau. The crankiness of Thoreau's line, the mass of many lives of quiet des desperation, and the bossiness of beware any enterprise that requires new clothes are, in my ears, the groans and mutters of a man trying to free himself from what he perceives as a deadening culture. His lyrical prose, though, is also a love letter to his neighbors and inheritors, pointing the way to a better way of living on Earth. If it were not so, he could have spared himself the effort of working up Walden from his journals. And his work was not wasted. Just as Thoreau's experiment in living life closer to the bone reverberates in nurturant writers today like Wendell Berry, Mary Oliver, Gary Snyder, and Terry Tempest Williams, so too his essay on civil disobedience inspired Mahatma Gandhi and through him, Dr. King. He's one of the highest examples I know of writing as a form of cultural and personal liberation. And along with celebrating the Women's March, I think it's appropriate to remember what our earliest New what our early New England ancestor Henry uh, accomplished by holding assumptions, prevailing assumptions about success among his conquered neighbors up against the grand uh, yardsticks of the seasons and the woods. Similarly, what Sicily and Persephone can now convey is the availability of an older, deeper alternative to the culture of getting and spending. The all-inclusive love of Earth represented by the image of the goddess is encoded in our DNA the women's movement, gay liberation, and cultural challenges to the male-female binary by transgendered people all spring from a project of human liberation that may also allow us to factor the health of the earth more firmly into our social structures and cultural assumptions. We can't move directly or easily from one model of organizing our cities, our knowledge, and our economy to another. But we may be guided by an appreciation for the possibilities of progress through dialectic as we attempt to struggle forward together. Persephone's seasons in the shade of the underworld and in the warmth of the harvest are no more opposites than are men and women, nature and culture, earth and sky, 
America in the world. All find their health in a circle of mutual dependence and mutual recognition. As Wallace Stevens writes in Notes Toward a Supreme Fiction, this is the origin of change. Winter and spring, cold copulars embrace, and forth the particulars of rapture come. Thank you. Well, well, thank you for coming. And, and uh, as Arena said, I'm very feel free to, to, to go if you have other commitments. But if you'd like to stay and, and mix it up a little with some questions and comments, I would love that. Yeah. OK, um, let me repeat uh, or rephrase Jake's question here. Um, his question was, how, how was I connecting uh, things like the, the, the Women's March and the Civil Rights Movement to climate change? And uh, again, as I say, this is very much a work in pro progress, and I think I need to keep working that. But here's how, here's how I'm connecting it at this point. Uh, my sense is that um, as we work forward through dichotomies, you know, and that's dialectic, as, as apparent, apparent opposites enter into dialogue and something new comes out of them, one, one of the things um, that I see in uh, the women's movement, for instance, is while it, while it begins in part with... Uh, the statement of, of, of needs and rights and, and desires of women in the face of a culture that doesn't always allow them uh, adequate options uh, actually becomes uh, a model of a more inclusive way of thinking, that, that a hierarchical approach in which um, men uh, have more prerogatives than women is one that finally uh, goes along with an approach to nature where instead of nature having essential rights, uh, it becomes simply the raw materials for human projects and the way in which rich people can, can uh, make poor people do what they want. So it has to do with um, a way of thinking that's mechanistic and hierarchical. And, and, and so my sense is that in climate change, the, the problem with, we've really not done very well at engaging with such a big problem. You're very welcome, bye bye. Uh, we, so we haven't done very well with, with engaging with, with that big problem. I think in part because our culture so emphasizes individual advantage. You know, each of us enriching ourselves and, and having our way. It's very hard to sacrifice anything. And it's very hard to attain a sense of the collective. So uh, the, the argument I was making toward the end is that there is an ongoing romantic reaction against uh, a world that's uh, a worldview that's mechanical and dom domination based, and that uh, only such a kind of reaction can help us to deal better with climate change, and that interestingly, it seems to me, related to the women's movement. And the reason I thought that was, after the inauguration, I was feeling pretty blue, and after the women's march, I was feeling great, and it made me uh, draw a connection that I'm still working on with Persephone in a modern American. So it's the static, it's the, the way that, because of the um, way uh, our culture and, and our industrial culture are uh, just, um, our, our culture, culture works so firmly entrenched in this, in this way of thinking that Empirical or empirical would not really matter because the fact, the fact is that it's entrenched in this people and individuals moving up and moving forward, and that's what's important, not the people around us and the people around us. Well, the, the, we have a tendency, and you know, it's funny, sometimes we think, how can we ever shake these norms of American society? But a lot of the things we're looking at now, the, the, um, the domination of consumerism, for instance, and the uh, uh, incredible uh, consumption of fossil fuels is much, much more intense than it was before World War II. You know, we, so the p part of the thing that makes Persephone interesting to me is sometimes people say, well, you reach outside Western culture to Native American culture or to Buddhism to, to claim values corrective to our current one, but they're foreign to us. They're outside us. And what interests me with uh, Persephone and the goddess and... Uh, and the Virgin Mary and, and, the, and the church's uh, declaration of her assumption to heaven is that this is from the heart of our culture. You know, it's not exotic, uh, but perhaps it's being reclaimed in a new context. 
So that's the argument I'm, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to work with. It's a, it's a weighty one, but your question's very good. Oh, good, good. Please, yeah, Dan. Just an observation. Um, in, in, the, um, in the days after the, the marches, there were, um, you'd see a lot of headlines that, that were asking questions. Where do we go for, from here? What's going to happen next? What will, um, uh, were these, what, what was the meaning of the marches and, 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 and so forth? But they were all sort of directed uh, to, uh, to, toward the future, you know, not, not, looking at the, not looking at the past. But what you've done tonight is, is um, I think, pretty successful, if you don't mind my saying, um, place the women's march within, within this uh, cultural and human um, context and, and, and continuum. Yeah. Um, and um, and you're saying, um, I, I, this is sort of putting it closely, I suppose. But we go forward by, by going back, or at least we go forward by by looking at at the roots that that already exist that we're not recognizing, or, or that we need to recognize more. I guess would be a better way of yes. saying. Yes. So that's um, yeah, that's. I, I think that's very. I think that's very helpful, Dan. And and. Um, Talking, talking about the question, where do we go next? I don't know if everyone heard that after the, after the women's marches. Uh, I mean, it, it is a conundrum. Uh, I've been revising and revising this thing all, all week. And at first, I began with the language of koans. From Zen, I thought, well, I, let's stick with West here tonight. But, but koan, as you know, in Rinzai, Rinzai tradition of Zen Buddhism, is a, a kind of riddle, but it's not one with a solution. It's, it's, it's something you have to take into your whole being and manifest in a way that goes beyond superficial logic. And, and that's, that's what the climate change seems to me to be, because it's not a problem separable from everything about our way of life. That's the problem. That's the real challenge. And that's why Persephone just struck me. And this, uh, again, I, I think this connection with the women's movement, I, I appreciated Jake's question there, too, is between the women's movement and, and um, Persephone, it's, it's provocative, but complex. But, um, you know, we understand things at different levels. And, and while they were great, and we watched avidly on TV and in the messages that came to us, the various things, we watched Bernie's talk, we watched all that stuff, and it's all great. But my sense is what's most interesting about it is the deep, uh, almost uh, ceremonial aspect of people walking along wearing, wearing the same kinds of uh, pink hats. And it, at first, people said, oh, don't do that. That's silly. That's, uh, that's trivializing. But I think there was something about it. I, again, I kept thinking of this picture of my son, who's a large man, considerably larger than me, with his, looking like a lumberjack with his big bushy beard, with his pink hat on. And, and I thought, this, this picture is going to get me through a few weeks now. It made me feel, it made me feel so happy. So this is not, I'm trying to find images that, uh, uh, let me read you a little something. Something I cut out because I didn't want to go on forever. But as I say, I was just, I've just been working on this. I don't know whether it'll come back into the other version either. But uh, I've been reading a book since I got back uh, called uh, Invisible Cities by, by Italo Calvino. And I'd read it before. But I, something about this topic made me want to read it. And so Marco Polo is telling Kublai Khan about the various cities in his empire, that Kublai Khan's too old to visit, his empire is too big. But, but Marco Polo doesn't know how to speak a language that Kublai Khan speaks. So he has to try to, that's, and I, I, I put this in to talk about how I felt with this project, because I don't have the language yet. I just uh, can try to use emblems. But, so what, what Marco Polo does is to try to mime what he's seeing, to try to gesture it. So, so Marco Polo could express himself. This is a part I was going to read, and I, then I cut it. It's a big, big X on that page. Um, <laughs> He could only express himself with gestures, leaps, cries of wonder and of horror, animal barkings or hootings, or with objects he took from his knapsacks, ostrich plumes, pea shooters, quartzes, which he arranged in front of him like chess men. Returning from the missions on which Kubla sent him, the ingenious foreigner improvised pantomimes that the sovereign had to interpret. One city was depicted by the leap of a fish, escaping the cormorant's beak to fall into a net, another city by a naked man running through fire, unscorched, a third by a skull, its teeth green with mold, clenching a round white pearl. Uh, and then it, it says it, uh, at the end of the passage, obscure or obvious as it might seem, everything Marco displayed had the power of emblems, which once seen cannot be forgotten or confused. And I was thinking about reading that just to say, 
I'm trying to say something that I don't really have the language or the ideas to say. I mean, that, it, it, you know, Jake's, Jake's question went there. What does, finally, what does Persephone have to do with the Women's March? Uh, that's what I'm gesturing toward. Uh, but it's not, it's not, I think, available immediately, at least to me, on the surface. Any, any other questions? These are excellent questions. Yeah, go for it. You know that, that when you were in the Chepelou? Yeah. You know that, that the Statue of Mary was holding a pomegranate. Yes. Do you believe that there's any link between between that, between that use of pomegranate and that, that's such a good thing to ask you. What is your name? Yes. What, what is your name, please? Um, Sean. Sean. So Sean's question uh, was, what what connection do I find between the between the pump ground in her in her right hand and Persephone? And that's actually a perfect example of what I, I was just starting to try to get at, which is. Um, it connected with my sense that the Virgin Mary and Persephone are playing for the same team, I suppose you could say. You know, they're, 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 they're pomegranates as opposed to, say, falcons. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> but but uh, that there is something about that. And, and the fact that this Padre Aurelio, this, this Franciscan, said, oh, it's a symbol of the church. In Sicily, it is. Clearly, it is in Sicily. Uh, but um, the other thing, another idea I was playing with is that statue, as I say, was polychrome. A lot of early statues, classical and medieval, were, were, were brightly colored with paint. And, um, but now it's faded, so it's kind of pink. So I was thinking about the pink, pink hats, you know. Oh. So, so just, just kind of, but your question's a really good one, and, and, and probably that's worth looking at more. There, there's a way in which she's saying, uh, and I'm just being whimsical now, she's holding up the pumpkin, she's saying, remind you of anything? <laughs> bring, any, bring anything to mind, <laughs> but and that's the way a lot of these cultural themes and strands work. So I think it's a great, a great question. Yeah. Uh, other, any other? Please. Yeah. Fred. Hi, yeah. Fred. Yeah, John. I really like the way you just used the word ceremonial yeah. as you were talking about the women's march, and it was reminding yeah. me of, and I felt the same way, very much buoyed up by that. Um, and there were also, over that weekend, a series of, of vigils all around the country for the earth that had a similar kind of ceremonial sense to it. Yes. And, and we had one of those in Brattleboro. And it was so moving to be with people just in silence, lighting candles, um, standing with signs. And people afterwards said, yeah, we really need to be doing these kinds of things. And I've heard a lot of people say that you know, we need every month, we should be doing something like this, or we should be marching like that. And your comment gets me thinking that um, the power of ceremonial acts to both help us find our way and to keep us connected with our communities and our values that we need. I just, there's something interesting there's something that I there, want to there. explore, yeah. Did, did people all understand what Fred was just saying, just in hearing it? Um, it, you know, here's a way to think about ceremony. Um, ceremony is something, uh, it's a collective enactment. Uh, and when we went down, um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not a Catholic, but I, uh, my wife is, and I'm uh, uh, a member of her church, you know, and so I like to go to, I, I often go to uh, services with her at places like Weston, and, and I went down every morning very early to, to do the chanting and prayer uh, service in the Chefalu Monastery, where basically we read the prayers of St. Francis in responsive form together out of, out of a little book, so I could, I could you know, come up with the right words. And to stand a little group of people saying uh, words that are charged with insight and lyrical, lyrically cadenced, uh, is a powerful experience. It's different from doing it by yourself. You know, it's, it's less like meditation or cogitation than it is uh, a kind of consolidation. And, and we, we are not as rich in ceremonial framing of our lives as people in other cultures and times have been. We're trying to invent them. And you know, one of the things that people say who are skeptical about environmental issues or, or people seeking a an expression of complex spiritual experience is, well, that's new age or you know, that, that sort of thing. That's one of the words people use. But in fact, uh, ceremony 
is an ancient aspect of human life. We're, we're, uh, we have a ceremony deficiency. And, uh, to, and to know that there are continuous uh, ceremonies alive in the world and that we also can form new ways of enacting ceremony at this time is valuable. As, as I've said, and several of the questions have, have recognized this, it's very challenging to know how to move, I mean, with all of our concerns about something like climate change or about the direction of our national government, it's very hard to find a way of expressing our feelings that is constructive, literally constructive, that constructs something in which we can move forward together. And I think ceremony is a, is a way to think about that. Uh, it's, it's inclusive. Yeah, so a good question. Please, yeah. Then I'm thinking about uh, your initial use of the word uncanny, yeah. which is a wonderful word. Um, and linking that to maybe some other mindsets moving into an uncertain future of uh, being more comfortable or being accepting of the uncanny, the yes. un unknowable, the paradoxes of climate change and how we, how we deal with it. Um, also the idea of humility yes. and how humility also is often predicated on our sense of our smallness and our inability to <clears throat> change these, these larger issues that face us. Um, I just, I, I, I really like the word uncanny. Yes, and I, I, I like what you do. Kind of place it in, in the larger context of your, your, your talk this evening. And I, I, I like very much what you just said, too, about the relationship between the uncanny and uh, the, the humble. Yeah. That, that, I mean, there's something in us. You know, I know the psych psychologists have talked about the fact that there are people for whom, when they are writing along and they change something, have to totally blot out what was there. <laughs> so you can't see it anymore. And that, that goes along with the difficulty with ambiguity. And, and I think all of us have that to some extent, that, that we're, we're, living, we're living in a place that is going in more than one direction. And at, at dinner, we were talking about Americans and immigration, and other countries and immigration, too, where um, a lot of people are uh, upset about the fact that there's more than one language being spoken. It, it's upsetting. It's, it's, it's sort of like, well, we're on the same old street, but I'm hearing different words. You know, <clears throat> where am I? What's happening to my home? What's happening to me? And that's, that's understandable. And this is obviously uh, a time in the world when change is happening very fast. And, and uh, it's like a, in some ways it is like a dream where you're, you're losing your, your grip, the place to stand. And there's a lot to be said for um, uh, taking a kind of forbearing and quiet or humble <laughs> approach to that. It, it, it's hard to do, but finally more, I think, more rewarding. Uh, but the sense that, you know, Freud would say, uh, the ambiguity of dreams, the uncanniness of it, it, we're disturbed by the fact that we see a person who we recognize, but the hair color is wrong, or the, you know, something else, the, the gender. So it's both like and not like. Uh, that disturbs us, but it also fascinates us. It's a, it's a glimpse you know, that, that makes us feel we might be able to put something together here. Please. Sure. Um, I'm uh, fascinated by the, the way your essay um, brings us a, a group of opposites, um, places before us, you know, the Enlightenment versus the Romantics, yeah. um, uh, the, the national government versus climate change, if you will. Um, but then, um, in the end, extends a hand or an embrace, anyways, of those dialectics, allowing them to be in dialogue, or or even to be, you know, perhaps um, uh, more uh, dancing with each other, oh, like and um, and and to me that's hopeful because when <laughs> when you're when one's thinking about climate change, one's thinking, uh, of course, about this deep connection with with the earth, but one's also thinking about the importance of our, our scientific community and its data and its and its gathering of, of facts and, and ideas and the, the use of those ideas to, to help us, hopefully, um, <laughs> to, to find a, a way through this, this solution. So it seems to me that we both need the Enlightenment 
and the romantics. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, in 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 that in that kind of embrace or, or reconcilement that you bring your essay to. Or or dance, as you say. You know, one of the things um, I, I came to feel uh, over many years of teaching in a liberal arts college was that. There were a couple of ideas I thought people should really come out of their education with. One was the notion of dialectic, where you have apparent opposites, uh, the thesis and the antithesis, and then they collide, and out of it comes a synthesis. You know, you move forward, which, which generates its own antithesis. And uh, I find that hopeful, too, that, that apparent opposition can be, if we approach it in the right spirit, uh, the basis for progress. And in, in America now, where one of the things people, <coughs> somebody's recommendation, I pulled up on the computer a frontline series called The Divided States of America, which is pretty, pretty uh, uh, strong and alarming in some ways. We, we, have a, we have a house divided against itself now, you know, and that cannot stand, as we know from Lincoln. But this is an opportunity to engage in more serious dialogue across divisions that have not been taken seriously enough. That might, that might help us to move forward. And, uh, and I think the same thing is true with, I mean, Persephone is an ancient god, almost invisible because she's been covered over with, with more modern uh, versions. Uh, she's both distant and very close at hand. And that's a, that's a kind of paradox. We, I mean, the Romantics loved ghost stories. And the, one reason I think they lo love them is because ghosts are both absent and present, and they give us, they, they give us a, a way to think about those things. Maybe we'll take one more question, and I would love to chat with people individually. Was there, there was one more question back there. Right? Was I right to see? I was thinking was about, you? Yeah. First, I wanted to thank you. Your, your essay is beautiful. I really enjoyed your writing. Thank you. Speaking. Um, and I was thinking quite a bit about what you said about um, Gaia being 40,000 years old. Yes. Older than in many ways, a lot of the, what we what we know about um, much about, older, huh? much and, older, yeah. And also, I mean, ultimately thinking about a lot of how the myths of the world, in many many places, are the same yes. in their own ways. But I was actually thinking about how in the in the ancient time of knowing Gaia, the way they did, eventually the Earth covered itself with ice, and out of that became the matriarch society, which then flipped over to the patriarchy. And in some ways, we're still there. I don't know whether, how much was going on between those two places, but I was actually thinking a lot about how where we are right now with the Women's March, with the climate change, and this, you know, energetic shift that the, the world, Gaia, is saying to us, are you going to find balance or shall I? Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, that's right, um, it, and it's interesting. Again, these things are so vast. These ideas are, yeah. are so vast that, uh, again, that's why I've, I've acknowledged more than once that that uh, they don't lend themselves to uh, confident assessment. They're so much bigger than the assessor. But but as you say, this has to do with earth earth history as well. When when uh, when the the goddess was uh, uh, was uh, worshipped. And the paintings were put up in the caves like Lascaux. That that was in, 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 obviously you, you've been doing some reading here, and I'm sure you know lots of things about it that I don't. But that was uh, a, an interglacial moment. And it's funny those 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 artists in France and Spain were eating reindeer, and uh, and and they were there were almost no trees because it was right after the withdrawal, one of the withdrawals of the glaciers. Yeah. And so these big forces do step in and change our our thinking. Um, I mean, one way or the other, um, uh, you can, Bill McKibben has talked about the fact that you can repeal human laws, but you can't repeal the laws of physics, you know, and, and that uh, carbon in the atmosphere changes the climate. And, it, and it's already been changed, really. The, the question we're dealing with is do we want to hold out for catastrophic climate change, or do we want to see if we can mitigate it some, to some degree now? So that, that dealing with larger issues is the, the challenge. Well, what, what good questions. I really appreciated them. Why don't we stop now? And I, I'd be glad to hang out here if anybody would like to talk individually. And if anybody wants to buy a book back there, I'd be glad to come up and sign the you bring down here and sign them if people are wanting to talk more. So thank you.